Hello, thank you for joining us. My name is Daniel Walkley. I'm a musculoskeletal sonographer from Adelaide, Australia. Uh, today, myself and my colleague, Matthew Goulet, uh, we work together both clinically and in a teaching form under our teaching arm, MSK Australia. Um, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Tonight, we're gonna be talking about anterior hip pain and lateral hip pain assessment and how we go about these in the introductory setting using ultrasound. So why do we get this anterior hip pain? Well, because we do fantastic movements. We do these strong, powerful movements at end range. We do chopping, changing, change of direction, as well as just overload and overuse. So we tend to break these injuries down into, is it an overuse injury or is it an acute strain? And getting the correct clinical history from the patient will help guide how you look and how you assess and how you interpret your imaging. So I really like the DOA classification of groin pain assessment. I think it's a, a fantastic way to go about, one, clinically assessing a patient, and two, putting, you know, how you guide your sonographic assessment. <clears throat> so the ones we're going to talk about today are anterior hip pain and hip flexor-related pain. So when we assess the anterior hip joint, we're looking at two things. We're looking at the extra articular structures. And when we're having a look at the hip joint capsule itself, we're having a look at the iliofemoral and pubifemoral ligaments, which make up the, the anterior hip joint capsule. And then when we have a look underneath here, we get a, a smaller assessment, not only of the capsule, but of the anterior joint recess. We get a very limited assessment of the anterior labrum, and we can get a very minimal assessment of the anterior cartilage. But if we look and pay attention to these, we can we can start to get an indication of what is happening in the intraarticular hip using ultrasound. Now, ultrasound is in no way the best test for assessing intraarticular pathology, uh, but we can get a pretty good idea as to whether that hip is stirred up and whether it's cranky. Is there free fluid in there? Is the joint capsule thickened? Is there damage to the anterior labral portion that we can see? Is there any indication of cartilage lost or osteophytic spurring? and we can get a pretty good indication as to what's going on sonographically. Back to our DOA assessment, our different differential classification, there's hip joint pain and then there's hip flexor related groin pain. And this comes down to two muscles primarily. Your first is your iliopsoas. <clears throat> In the anatomy of your iliopsoas, you have your iliacus muscle with your lateral and medial fibers running down, forming its conjoint tendon and the rest of our psoas muscle coming down to form the conjoint tendon, creating this iliopsoas complex. So the iliopsoas tendon forms at the posterior aspect of the muscles, runs through the back of the pelvic brim. Medial iliacus bundle variably merges with psoas. So sometimes you can have multiple slips. And sometimes the, the psoas component doesn't even form the true conjoint tendon of the iliopsoas tendon. It has its own tendon all the way down on the lesser trochanter. So it can have its own tendon slip that makes its way the whole way down. So being aware and assessing, are there multiple slips? I'll run back. Are there multiple slips involved? Tendons with multiple slips uh, tend to be more symptomatic if they're going to become irritated in a young hip flexor adolescent patient because the tendon slips in the muscle can slide on one another with repeated hip flexion activities and become a bit irritated. So multiple slips are the ones that we send, tend to see in the clinic that are more symptomatic. The other structure that we need to assess with, with hip flexor related groin pain is the rectus femoris. So your rectus femoris has two heads, it's straight and it's, it's a straight head or it's direct head, which comes straight off the anterior inferior iliac spine and runs straight down into the muscle. And then we have our reflected head or our indirect head that originates on the anterior lateral acetabular brim and forms the lateral component of the lateral labrum. So what we'll do now is we'll, we'll head into a bit of scanning. We'll show you how we assess these areas. <clears throat> 
anterior hip joint assessment. First of all, what we're going to do is we're going to assess the hip joint proper itself. So we'll just find the anterior hip, put our probe straight on the front and have a look. We'll identify our femoral head. We'll identify the anterior aspect of our acetabulum. We'll see the front triangular shape of the anterior labrum. And then we'll scan down and assess the femoral head neck junction. And we'll have a look at our hip joint capsule itself. So the capsule anteriorly here is the anterior iliofemoral ligament. So if you were to have a joint effusion, this is where it would be. If you were to have joint synovitis, this is where it would be within the joint capsule itself. We can have a limited assessment of the anterior labrum and the joint itself. From here, what we're going to do is assess our iliosolus complex. So from the front of the, the joint itself, we're going to get on that femoral head neck junction and just turn our probe 90 degrees. And here we are on the femoral head and as we scan up onto the iliopectineal eminence of the acetabulum. So femoral head, acetabulum, and our iliosolus sitting on top where we have the medial fibres of our iliacus, our lateral fibres of our iliacus, residual fibres of our psoas and neurovascular bundle sitting medially. So we see our iliosolus tendon sitting nicely on the iliopectineal eminence of the acetabulum. So this is where we go about looking for iliosolus bursitis, which is often secondary to hip joint pathology itself. Remember that the iliosolus bursa in most cases is contiguous with the hip joint itself. So if you're doing an iliosolus bursal injection, you're really doing a hip joint injection. If we were to do an iliosolus bursal injection, this is the approach we would use. Find your iliosolus tendon sitting at the top, so find your head, acetabulum, line yourself up, fix your anisotrophy and get a nice approach in here. Bring your needle in at about a 45 degree angle laterally and slip down to hit the top of the acetabulum. So you slip underneath the tendon in onto the acetabulum to do your iliosolus bursal injection. If we were to do an anterior hip injection or aspiration, if they had an effusion, you wanted to see what was happening as to why it was effusion, what the fluid contents was, if it's your query infection, or if you're looking at injecting the hip joint itself. I like a longitudinal approach on the hip joint. So I like to come on in in longitudinal and bring my needle down from an inferior aspect coming in through here. So we go down, we drop down, we hit on that head neck junction, but really as long as you get anywhere underneath the iliofemoral ligament, un as long as you're anywhere underneath that joint capsule, you're within the joint and you'll see you can hear anywhere along here, pop your needle down and as it injects you'll see it fill up the space, you'll see that capsule lift on off. So drop down in through there. The other structure we want to assess at the front of the hip is our rectus femoris. So all we're going to do is have a look from the front of our hip joint in longitudinal and we're going to move our probe laterally. So we're going to slide out laterally to where you rise up here onto our anterior inferior iliac spine. This is our rectus femoris direct head. And then we see this little bit of shadowing in through here. This is our reflected head diving down, diving around to originate on the lateral aspect of the acetabulum and the lateral labrum and the lateral capsular structures. So our direct head in through here, you can assess for apophyseal changes, you can uh, assess for traction apophysitis, avulsion fractures up in through here of our rectus femoris direct head, and our indirect head reflects around the side. To identify our indirect head, we go just from this view, and we bring our probe around laterally from a very lateral approach, and here is our indirect head of rectus femoris running out and along into its musculature. Back up in through here. So that's one way of getting to rectus femoris. The other way of getting to rectus femoris is from the anterior hip joint. So we're here, we find our iliosolus, and we're just going to bring our probe lateral and a little bit superior to identify the anterior inferior iliac spine. So there's our ASIS and our rec fem coming off with our reflected head, giving its contributory to the muscle. So anterior hip joint, anterior hip joint injection, iliosolus bursal injection, rectus femoris assessment. <laughs>
So when we have a look at pathology that we can see using ultrasound, we often see these little anterior label tears. So anterior label tears are very, very common to see both on MRI and on ultrasound. So seeing defects in the little anterior component of the labrum that we can see is not uncommon. Uh, remember, around about 90% of all females over 30 have an anterior label tear. So seeing pathology in the anterior labrum is not uncommon and this needs a good clinical correlation as to whether you believe this is associated with a patient's pain or symptoms. These label tears can become a bit bigger and when they are bigger, they are usually associated with degeneration of the joint. <clears throat> so label tears are the early onset of osteoarthritis and as that continues, you start to see more osteoarthritic changes. So you see the bony lipping of the anterior acetabulum up in through here, here's our iliosolus tendon coming around the front. So we see not only a, a, a complex anterior label tear, but we also see bony lipping changes on that anterior acetabulum. So we know there's a bit more going on in this joint. Label tears and, and paralabel cysts can become very large. They can become very big. And commonly, as in this case, in a grossly arthritic hip joint, <coughs> these anterior label cysts, paralabel cysts can extend up and around and underneath iliosolus. They can, they can become really big, extend the whole length over the hip joint capsule and, and merge and infiltrate through iliosolus. Now, what's the treatment of these in, in the younger patient when there's not much osteoarthritis underlying? Well, in the young symptomatic patient, they do an anterior label repair. And this is what they look like in the post-surgical setting where you see your bony anchor, your suture material through the anterior labrum. The other thing that I want to talk about and I want to discuss as, as to why we have a lot of these label tears is because of the, the CAM deformities that people have. Well, it's a, it's a CAM abnormality, not a deformity. The abnormality is common. About 20% of the population have this CAM deformity, which is a, a lack of centering of the femoral head on the neck complex, and you have an extra little bit of bone as a result that sits on, on the supralateral margin of the femoral head neck junction. Uh, it's believed to be embryologically a part of a metapiphysis of uh, the femoral neck. Um, it's an embryological change. You develop it during adolescence. But if you have one of these, it predisposes you to developing the, the phenomenon of phen femoroacetabular impingement. So with this, your femur and your acetabulum are butt and you cause degenerative changes in the antro, supraantrolateral joint. So with this additional bit of bone, it runs up and with hip flexion activities, pushes and irritates your labrum up in through here. So it causes degenerative change in the superior anterior lateral component of the hip joint. Now we can appreciate these sonographically and we can see them quite nicely. So if we go from our femoral head neck junction and go to the supralateral component, we often see that little extra bit of bone on the side. And as I said, about 20% of the population have these, so you'll see these not uncommonly. So we go from our anterior joint down our femoral head neck junction and scoot our probe out laterally and you'll see your additional part of bone. And as I said, why are these significant? Well, it tends to cause anterior hip joint pathology. So femoral acetabular impingement syndrome in the latter stages causes, can lead to significant hip joint osteoarthritis. Again, in through here, we have femoral head and we have a loss of concavity of a femoral head neck junction. So there's not enough concavity here. We have that additional component of bone anterior label tearing, degeneration, paralabel cyst formation. And the final stage is your osteoarthritic hip. So with hip flexion, you see the cam deformity and the acetabulum abut on each other, leading to that degenerative change in the anterior lateral joint. <clears throat> However, in the earlier stages, we can start to see some of the imaging findings that you look for on MRI in the setting of femoral acetabular impingement is one of, the, one of the big things that you look for is you look for the bony pitting. Uh, you look for the bony irregularity on the top of the acetabulum to suggest that that femoral head neck complex has been abutting into it. So we appreciate that sonographically if we go from our iliopsoas view 
just lateral to our iliopsoas, we see the bony pitting changes on the pelvic brim. So the acetabular cortical changes around in through here are indicative that you're developing a bit of femoral acetabular impingement. One thing you may come across, and there's, there's some more evidence, more literature and, and more people doing it, although the evidence is still a little bit vague, is with your CAM resection. So if you are a young adolescent patient with a CAM deformity and you're getting femoral acetabular impingement syndrome and you have not yet developed osteoarthritis, then sometimes they will go in and they will resect that additional component of bone. So we will see our acetabulum, our femoral head, and here they have scalloped out that component, that CAM component of that femoral head neck junction. So they have made that a bit more concave. We can see that they have gone in and incised through the lateral hip joint capsule, and you can see the suture material on the side end through here. So they've done a, done a capsular closure as well. So we see these sonographically. Stepping away from that, the other pathologies that we can see within the hip <clears throat> are the secondary signs of osteoarthritis. So we see synovitis, so joint inflammation. So the joint capsule is thick, edematous, and a small amount of fluid in through here. So again, very hip, very thick hip joint capsule. And if you're unsure, comparison to the other side is quite an easy thing to do. So put your probe on the other side, assess the thickness of that joint capsule, because sometimes it can be slightly underwhelming. Again, we see our hip joint effusions. And again, these can just be small trace amounts of fluid within the joint. So very, very subtle amount of fluid in through here. Again, if you are unsure compared to the other side, Getting the right history is imperative. So when we have a look in through here, we see one hip joint capsule, which is normal, and we see our symptomatic side, which is slightly thicker, so subtly thicker. Getting the right history with this patient is key. Assessing this hip joint capsule and going, mm, it's slightly thick. <clears throat> when you find out that they are a middle distance runner who have rapidly increased their training volume, and they are getting pain that comes on reproducibly within their first couple of kilometers of running and does not stop and gets worse and they're very sore afterwards for the next couple of days and they cannot hop. So this video is courtesy of James Noak. Um, so this is a, an elite runner who's hopping, jumping, very springy, changed their symptomatic hip and they can't get off the ground. Try again and painful hopping, cannot propel off. We'll go again, normal hip springy bouncy lovely hop nice propulsion painless their symptomatic side they can't hop pain this is often indicative of a femoral neck stress fracture or a pelvic brim stress fracture but more common in, in males is your femoral neck stress fracture so if you have that that history of you, you think it's a stress fracture you see the capsule being a little bit thick and maybe a tiny bit of fluid in the joint capsule it's going to be a femoral neck stress fracture, and this is this is what we'll see. Uh, we'll see on the MRI, we'll see the edema and the fracture line running through the inferior aspect of the femoral head neck junction. Again, getting that history is key. <clears throat> this is another patient that was referred to us for query bursitis following a fall, and you talk to him a bit more, and that this patient can't wait there. And we have a look at their femoral head neck junction, we see... Well, first of all, we see a cortical breach in through here. So there, there's a cortical deficiency through our femoral head neck junction. There's a thick capsule and edema within that joint. This patient has a neck of femur fracture. And we can, we can pick these up sonographically if we get the right history. We put it together with what we're seeing and then we can, we can get the right imaging modality to confirm the diagnosis. Other things that you can see within the joint is just like any other joint within the body, you can appreciate crystalline diseases, crystalline arthropathies, so your calcium phosphate deposition disease. The other thing you can get with the hip is you can just get a hip joint capsulitis. So similar to adhesive capsulitis or frozen shoulder, in the shoulder you can get just an acute capsulitis. The same phenomenon can exist in the hip where you get a stiff, painful hip without chondral loss. And we have a look sonographically and we see the joint is grossly thick, grossly inflamed. In this setting, you wanna check and make sure there's no underlying inflammatory component and no underlying rheumatological component. But there is the phenomenon where you can just get an acute capsulitis of the hip. <clears throat> 
more commonly what we see is osteoarthritis of the hip. <clears throat> so we can see the changes, the more head neck junctional changes, the osteophytic lipping, the capsular thickening, and the fluid within the joint. What do we do with these? Well, the main thing we do under ultrasound is we inject these, and it's, it's a very nice, very easy injection to do. If you need to aspirate, if you want to see is the joint infected, it's a very easy procedure to do using ultrasound to guide down into that joint, aiming for the femoral head neck junction as we discussed in the scanning video, and putting your needle down into the joint. Very quick, easy, efficient way to inject a large joint. The other thing we're going to talk about is pathologies of the hip flexor. So we're going to talk about pathologies associated with our iliopsoas complex. Remembering that our psoas muscle forms medial, lateral fibers of iliacus, medial fibers of iliacus, and our iliopsoas bursal complex sitting underneath. So you can get your snapping or clicking hips. <clears throat> so a lovely example of a, of a clicking snapping hip we see the tendon rotate up and over top the medial fibers of iliacus getting caught underneath and snapping down under that tendon so you get the patient to do their provocative mover that promotes their click which is usually a flexion external rotation abduction extension kind of frog leg maneuver and you get them to do that click you put your probe in short axis on the iliopsoas and you will see the medial fibers of iliacus snap around and click under and through here so why do these hurt? We get inflammation if you do this repetitively. And you see nicely with your Doppler assessment that the medial fibers of iliacus here, both in grayscale, are quite edematous and swollen, but also with your Doppler assessment, you see the, the neovascularity within the muscle that's been acutely traumatized by this muscle snapping phenomenon. The other thing that you have with your iliopsoas is you have tears of the musculotendinous junction. When you're going to tear your hip flexor, when you're going to tear your iliopsoas complex, you tend to tear the medial fibers of iliacus. So medial fibers of iliacus, this is where you have your tear at the musculotendinous junction. We can turn longitudinally on it now. We see that significant tear at the musculotendinous junction. So just like most other muscle tears that we have, they tear at the musculotendinous junction. This is the, the most common point of your tearing pathology. And in your hip flexor is the medial fibers of iliacus. Now these tears can be quite small and quite subtle. So if we have a look in through here, is our medial fibers of iliacus, uh, iliopsoas tendon, and we see the, the echotextual abnormality of medial fibers of iliacus. Again, if you're unsure, go and compare to the other side. And you can see your medial fibers of iliacus with this beautiful normal echotextual component. So medial fibers of iliacus, musculotendinous junction tear. These tears can be quite large and extend the whole way up into the muscle belly. We're going up right into the pelvic brim in through here and a significant, I think we'll drop our depth in just a minute, a significant tear and a significant hematoma within the iliopsoas complex from a musculotendinous junction tear. This is an acute musculotendinous junction tear in an AFL football player. The other pathologies that you can have is you can actually tear the tendon. You can tear the iliopsoas tendon. <coughs> More commonly, this occurs post-surgically. So this is a, a post-hip replacement patient. And we see our iliopsoas tendon here, and it's it's wriggled, it's off tone, inserting an entral lesser trochanter down in through here. And we can see delamination thinning of that iliopsoas tendon, and we see quite a significant amount of atrophy of the muscle belly. You can also rupture your iliopsoas. And again, it's more common in your post-hip replacement patient but it can happen in, in other settings, primarily in your elderly patients. We'll follow our iliopsoas tendon down and we just see a little stump here and we see a little bony flake. This is meant to be inserting down in through here onto the lesser trochanter. So this is your iliopsoas rupture. Again, quite a rare entity. It's usually in the elderly patient who's had a fall and it comes away and they do periosteal stripping little bony flake, pull that periosteum off and rupture their iliopsoas complex. Again, same case, just in short axis, gross muscle atrophy, and that is meant to be inserting in it onto the lesser trochanter. <clears throat> but other pathology that you can have with your hip flexor is your iliopsoas bursa. So remembering that the iliopsoas bursa sits on the iliopectineal M eminence of the pubic ramus so that sits at the front of the hip joint here. It's, it's the largest synovial bursa in the body. 
the evidence suggests that about 15% of these communicate with the hip joint, but uh, that's wrong. Uh, nearly all of them do. So it, it's a big thing to take away, but your iliosalis bursa is often contiguous with your hip joint. It's what we see most commonly in, in the radiology setting. So your iliosalis bursa can often be quite subtle. So what you want is your iliosalis tendon sitting in short axis, sitting flush on the iliopectineal eminence. And in your athletic population and with those with hip flexor related groin pain who have a right history and do a lot of repetitive hip flexion activity, they can have inflammation of this iliosalis bursa. And in your athletic population, this is what it looks like, just a subtle bit of thickening under your iliosalis tendon lifting on up. So comparison to the other side, nice flush clean lines, loss of definition between the tendon and the bone and it's thicker and raised up. So this is your iliosalis bursa in an athletic popu population. It's lovely to do your needle work on. We can drive down, guide your needle down in underneath. It's a, it's a very nice way to assess these and drop your needle on in. Again, the iliosalis bursa, as I said, often is contiguous with the hip joint. Okay, so if you see a significant iliosalis bursa, it's usually coming from the hip and extending out into the iliosalis bursal complex. They can be quite large, uh, particularly in your rheumatological patients. They can be significantly large, but most of the time in an osteoarthritic setting, you see the bone, you start to see the bony change in through here and it's joint fluid that leaks on out into the iliosalis bursa. The one thing I want you to be aware of, and here's your proof in the pudding, here we are dropping our needle down under the iliosalis tendon, inject you on in. You see your injectate in this setting is running up and around the tendon. So even though our bevel was sitting down under the tendon here, we fill it up and as we fill up, boom, it drops down, it decompresses into the joint. I'll let this clip run again. So this is just proving that your iliosalis bursal complex is contiguous with the hip joint. So sitting up the top under your tendon, the iliosalis bursa, as we said, can, can snake around the tendon, can envelop in around that tendon that bursal complex fills on up as your injectate runs in and then it decompresses down into the joint, proving that direct communication between the iliosalis bursa and the anterior hip joint complex. So that's our iliosalis. Next, we have our rectus femoris. So our rect fem is a, is a tail of, of two. So we have our direct head. And our direct head pathology, or well, most common pathology of our direct head of our rectus femoris, is our avulsion fractures in our pediatric patients, our apophysitis, apophysitis or apophyseal fractures, and they pull the apophysis of the direct head of rect femoris off. And again, comparison between that and the other side is, is often quite useful. Other pathologies that you can have of your direct head is you can have calcific tendinopathy, not uncommonly. So your crystalline inflammatory process, or you can just have degenerative enthesopathy associated with that tendon as well. So you can get enthesis based calcification delaminations within that tendon. A reflected head of rectus femoris, and we've shown you how we get to this image to get around in through here to see that reflected head originate on the lateral aspect of the acetabulum and reflecting back to close the anterolateral capsule. Traumatically, with an avulsion, you can avulse the reflected head of rec fem as well. So again, in your pediatric patient, if there's a large fragment of bone in the post-traumatic se setting, so if they've done a kick and it's popped and they've got immediate pain, think avulsion and check your rectus femoris, both direct and indirect heads. If both heads are gone, then often surgical intervention is indicated or at least getting the opinion of an orthopedic surgeon in the pediatric population who's evolved both heads. The other thing that you tend to see in your reflected head is post hip scope. So when they go in through a hip scope, they use the anterolateral portal of the hip and they dive down through the reflected head. And as they go down in through the hip joint capsule, sometimes they'll harvest some of that reflected head to repair the anterior labrum. And not uncommonly, you will see heterotopic ossification of that tendon. You'll see calcification of that tendon of the anterolateral hip joint. And it can often be a big cause of their pain and of their symptoms, and they often respond quite well to injection therapy. So you can you can guide down and do an 
both an intra-articular and periarticular injection around that calcification, around into the hip joint itself proper. So you can you can fenestrate a bit of that, that heterotopic calcification as a result of that post-trauma setting. So fenestrating that, that calcium and also putting a bit into the hip joint. So you're doing an intra and periarticular hip joint injection and often works quite well to settle those patients down post hip scope that are failing to progress in their rehab. I hope this helps. Um, I'm going to now pass you on to Matt, who's going to talk about greater trochanteric pain syndrome and the sonographic assessment of these and, and how we go about it. Uh, thank you for joining us for this part, and I'll, I'll hand you on to Matt. Thank you. Hi, I'm Matthew from MSK Australia. In this webinar, I'm going to be discussing some common causes for lateral hip pain. Before we get to the pathology side of things, we need a good understanding of the regional anatomy. Now, uh, Greater decanter has this lovely facet anatomy. Uh, these bony landmarks are an easy way for us to distinguish our gluteus minimus and medius insertions. We'll discuss how to find these in our life scanning component, but our gluteus minimus has its insertion onto its anterior facet. It can appear L-shaped, teardrop-shaped. We don't really appreciate this on ultrasound, uh, but we can get a good understanding that it's onto that anterior facet. Uh, gluteus medius inserts onto our lateral facet and our superior posterior facet. We can see that oblique orientation of that tendon footprint runs at about 40 degrees. So our short axis and long axis on this tendon have to be oblique to that uh, femoral shaft. Now, all just under those anterior fibers of the uh, glute medius tendon is this bare area here. And this is a a site which we're going to talk about a little later with our pathology and our posterior facet is just a bare facet at the back and, and this may be where we can appreciate a little bit of bursal fluid at times. Our gluteus minimus has this wide attachment onto the inferior ilium. These anterior fibers have a um, form the tendon which has a reasonably straight course. The posterior muscle fibers form that tendon and it has to acutely turn to plug in onto that anterior so we can see those posterior fibers coming around there and plugging in so let's just have a look at that in our scanning so here's our long axis those anterior fibers running through there if we play that run posterior we'll see the posterior fibers wrapping around so wrapping right around the back coming back through to those straighter anterior fibers if we look here in our short axis anterior posterior we'll appreciate our anterior running off one way and our posterior extending out to form that fan shaped tendon our gluteus medius it covers right over the top of our gluteus minimus and covers right from asis to psis uh, the muscle forms two distinct tendons we have an anterior band through this side and here it is here appearing ruptured and we have our posterior band. So that anterior band that attaches onto a lateral facet, that has its muscle fibers from the anterior two thirds of the muscle and our posterior band, the posterior one third. So this is our anterior band. Let's just highlight the muscles here. So this is our gluteus maximus sitting over the top, our gluteus medius with its musculotendinous junction coming down onto the lateral facet and we have our gluteus minimus. So here is our anterior band where we form this uh, tendon deep and it runs superficial and inserts onto this wide flat tendon. Our, po our posterior band has a straighter course in it and the tendon forms within the central part of that muscle it runs distally and it thickens up as it inserts onto that posterior superior facet. So here we can see that maximus, medius with its posterior band running through and down, down low here we have our ex deep external rotators of the hip underneath. If we look at that uh, in short axis, posterior, we can see that big thick tendon coming out and supplying that posterior third. Come back up, we have our anterior fibers. We'll just play that through again. And here's our anterior fibers coming deep and supplying that anterior third. 
over the top of these, uh, forming a, a little almost look of a sort of deltoid lying over, over our rotator cuff is our tensor fascia latte at the front, our iliotibial band, and our gluteus maximus. We'll touch on our bursa anatomy here. We have our subgluteus maximus bursa or our trochanteric bursa and our subgluteus medius and subgluteus minimus sitting under their respective tendons. That's our anatomy side of things. So we'll move on to a bit of live scanning and come back with pathology. trochanteric pain syndrome. So the main cause of this is our tendinopathy of our, or tears of our gluteus minimus or medius tendon. To locate these tendons, what we want to do is we want to palpate for our greater trochanter and start in a transverse view. And if we see we don't have bone underlying, we just need to scan inferiorly and then we come on to our greater trochanter. If we come too far, we're onto a round bone of our femur. So we want to see these flat facets, and we know we're at our gluteal uh, insertions. So we can see here this little ridge, and this represents our anterior facet and our lateral facet. So we want to start with our anterior facet, which is our gluteus minimus. So uh, with anything ultrasound, we want to be perpendicular to what we're looking at. So as we can see, that facet is extending down and ang uh, angling towards the front. So I'm going to roll my probe around so I can be more at 90 degrees to that facet and we can see that footprint of our gluteus minim minimus a lot better. And so that's our transverse view. As I go superiorly, that tendon wants to dive away deep. So what we need to do is just fan our probe back to get that at 90 degrees again and to minimise our own isotropy. And we can see that extending down and continuing deep there. So we can assess, and as I'm assessing, I'm rolling with that tendon, same as we would the biceps in the shoulder. So we want to roll and fan as we come up. So we'll turn 90 degrees on there, and there's our tendon at 90 degrees, and we can assess in a pretty neutral position our footprint of that gluteus meat minimus and just roll back and forth as we want to see further down towards the musculotendinous junction we need to go superiorly and just heel toe and push that top of that probe in and just put a bit of pressure into the patient we're able to see that musculotendinous junction extending up towards the hip joint there so we can assess all the way across that tendon from back and forth once we're happy with our assessment of the gluteus minimus, we just turn back transverse again. There's our gluteus minimus. We can see our gluteus medius muscle coming over the top of it there. To assess our tendon, we're just gonna roll posterior. And what we find is we're onto our lateral facet there. Now the gluteus medius actually has a slightly oblique insertion at about 40 degrees. So what we need to do is we don't want to keep our true short axis on the femur. I want to rotate my probe and be more 45 degrees to the femur, 40, 45. And then we can see there we're in a true short axis of that gluteus medius. So we're on our lateral facet here. Gluteus medius actually uh, occupies both the lateral facet and a superior posterior facet. So if we come a little bit further posterior, and just continue up through, we can see a second facet, our posterior superior facet with our gluteus medius coming off there. So we wanna follow that all the way through and we can see our two tendons. And then we wanna assess it in our long axis. So we'll come around 90 degrees to where we were. And from our lateral facet, we can see this tendon comes off and it dives down. It's, the musculotendinous junction has a very steep decline. So I can come up and just a little bit of a heel toe just to get a, a nice appreciation of that and come back up onto our foot plate again. For our posterior superior facet, we will just roll around the back a little further 
and we'll come on to a, a thicker tendon, a, a small direct tendon that has a direct attachment and it comes a bit more straighter. So this is a nice tendon to look at. So we can see that running across. We have a couple of little tendons attaching under that from our deep external rotators of the hip, but we're able to assess that posterior attachment there really nicely. So we'll scan all the way until we're off and back. Now we'll just come back into short axis again. So that's our posterior superior facet. And then we have a posterior facet, which is just a bare area. And sometimes if we'll have a little bit of uh, bursal fluid, this is where it will accumulate right back there, posterior. So that's our gluteus minimus and medius. Our gluteus maximus has, uh, in this case, a majority of its attachment onto our iliotibial band coming across there. We can see that attaching on. And then as we continue down, just a small little attachment onto the femur just slightly posterior on that lateral aspect. We can see that just little tendon there, and this is where we might find our gluteus maximus tendinopathy, and also it's a, not an uncommon spot for uh, acute calcific tendonitis. So we might see uh, calcium back in there. So very important if the patient's indicating with one finger particularly a tender area around, we don't want to just exclude it as uh, general greater trochanteric pain syndrome. We want to make sure we assess a little area further down if they're very specific. So that's our gluteus maximus. So when we're doing injections of our trochanteric bursa, it's, we, if we have really our focus of tendinopathy on one tendon, we like to try to approach over that tendon for our injection. So if we're mainly seeing changes in our gluteus minimus, we want to have that in view and and just the same as a, a bursal injection in the shoulder, just drop on over the top and just lay our uh, injectate over the top. Uh, obviously, fenestrating, intratendinous fenestration is also possible through this approach. Uh, for our true trochanteric bursal injection, we, we're likely just to go over the top of our gluteus medius there, and we can see that bursa really nicely, a little bit of gluteus maximus lying, and we'll just guide the needle in flat under onto there. We've got a lovely patient today. Some of them will be needing to approach from a more steeper angle. Uh, another thing to rule out with our lateral hip pain is occasionally we'll see our runners, particularly female runners, uh, present with our proximal iliotibial band syndrome. For this, we need to continue up and onto our iliac crest. So we'll go all the way up onto our iliac crest where we have our gluteus medius origin and our iliotibial band. So we can see here, we can appreciate that origin. It's just a very short, stubby little tendon. And what we want to do is we want to assess for any thickening of this tendon over the bone. But also, importantly, we want to look for any edema in the underlying muscle and overlying tissues. It's not uncommon to have a bit of chronic change through this area. It's about that uh, edema in the tissues around and focal tenderness over there. Uh, but that will typically present with a, a, a bit of discomfort through this upper lateral hip region. Uh, that's our lateral hip. Let's talk about some of the pathology we'll counter with a lateral hip pain. So the causes of lateral hip pain, the number one is our greater trochanteric pain syndrome, or more specifically, our gluteus minimus and medius tendinopathy and tears. I'll be mostly discussing that today. Uh, we'll also discuss our proximal iliotibial band syndrome and our gluteus maximus insertional tendinopathy. Uh, Dan's covering our hip pathologies, and we have a wide variety of other possible causes, which we won't have time to cover today, but you know, greater trochanteric pain syndrome is a great mimicker for um, these other pathologies. And we really want to have a good clinical assessment and history to try to narrow this list down. And it can coexist with uh, some of these other issues. So we, we really want to use our clinical judgment to try to decide which is the most likely cause. Some causes of our gluteal tendinopathy. Well, uh, weak gluteal tendons will uh, result in more tensile load on our tendons, which can result in uh, tendinopathy, a lower femoral neck shaft angle. What we can find is 
as that angle reduces, we will get more compressive load, not only on that tendon as it crosses across the bone and our bare area of our lateral facet, but also we'll get more compressive load of the overlying iliotibial band compressing down on it. And then we can have increased load with anything that can alter our gait. So whether it be uh, catching a silly walk condition or it could just be a sore foot, a sore knee changing gait, it could be a stiff back, sore back. So so anything that will alter our gait with six to 10,000 steps a day, day after day, will lead to um, tendinopathy of those tendons. Uh, these patients will quite often present with that lateral hip and thigh pain. They'll be focally tender over the greater trachea. That's a great giveaway. Uh, what we find is that they won't like to lie on that side. And, and if they're lying on the uh, asymptomatic side, they'll tend to want to put a pillow between their legs just to offload some of that compressive load of the iliotibial band over those tendons. They have difficulty standing up after extended periods of sitting, uh, but it, you know, quite often gradually improve as they walk. And they have weakness of gluteal muscles. These muscles are really important stabilizers of the pelvis. And so when they try to walk upstairs and put quite a bit of load through, uh, they'll have difficulty in pain. Uh, they'll also have a hard time single leg standing for extended periods. So with tendinopathy, uh, they'll get discomfort, they'll get weakness in those glutes. And obviously if we've got tears uh, and non-functioning glutes, what we'll find is to uh, when they're not functioning correctly, we'll end up without the pelvic pelvis being stabilised and we'll get this uh, positive Congelenberg gait where the hip pops out to the side and the glutes can't stabilise and keep everything straight. So we'll get that little pop out to the side or they might do the opposite and bring the shoulders over the top to try to uh, balance the load and take any weight off the glutes. Just a little uh, thing about bursitis. So we read a lot of reports uh, on ultrasound and MRI that state bursitis seen, they measure bursal thickness and they comment on bursal fluid. Now, bursas can adaptively thicken they're allowed to contain fluid and these are findings that don't really correlate with pain. And what what's been found time and time again is primary bursitis without gluteal tendinopathy is extremely rare. So we need to move our focus away from the bursa and bursitis to more the tendons and what is going on with the tendons. And that's why we're going to really focus in on those tendons today. So this was, uh, again, uh, another uh, study that's found that trochanteric bursitis with no adductor tendon pathology is extremely rare. So this is just a recent one from the Danish group that just happened to pop up on my Twitter a day or two after I got asked to speak about it. And I thought that was just a, uh, just a more confirmation of what we've all been thinking for a while. So gluteal tendon pathology will... will uh, I guess run the spectrum from uh, just run of the mill tendinopathy with a thickened hypoalcoic or heterogeneous tendon all the way to full thickness tears and ruptures. Some of our patients uh, may be challenging. Uh, we might have difficulty viewing these tendons at times. Uh, one of the helpful little guides could be looking for some cortical irregularity. Uh, at the footprint of these tendons, which can guide us to the possibility of a uh, little tear associated. So that, that's just a good cheat's way of trying to see if there's a little tendon tear there when we're really quite challenged. So let's talk about our gluteus minimus. So we, we discussed earlier how these posterior muscle fibers form that tendon which has to wrap around. So this is an area where we will get a bit more compressive load. Here's our posterior glute minimus here and we can see a little bit of tendinopathy and patchy change there we can see a tiny little bit of fluid in that sub minimus bursa there indicating this is possibly just a little stirred up because they were also focally tender there now i, I talk of this as more uh, uh peritendinous edema we can see just a little swelling all the way around uh, another case showing pretty much the same, that that posterior 
portion of our gluteus minimus. Uh, tendinopathic, we can see cortical irregularity pointing to just a couple of little splits through that tendon. And again, just a little bit of fluid in that bursa underneath. Much of the same, a bit more uh, cortical regularity, larger tear running through there. Again, mostly focused on that posterior portion and again, a, a little bit of reactive fluid in that bursa just nearby. Uh, pretty much showing the same. Uh, this is uh, just highlighting a little bit of dystrophic, uh, just degenerative calcification that we may see in our tendons, these little linear calcifications. Uh, we may have a little split running through with that, but this little linear calcification is uh, quite a common finding and not often associated with symptoms. Uh, it's more the tendon around it that we're a little bit more focused on. Uh, as we continue through the spectrum of pathology, we can have our full thickness tears. So is anterior and that posterior portion as we run around to the back we can see that's torn we like to i like to have a look at the muscle when i think there's a full thickness tear to look for any uh, atrophy of the uh, muscle associated with that tendon and we can see here as we run through that that posterior portion of our glute meter is atrophic there just confirming our suspicions this is that same patient. So this is anterior. As we run posterior, we can see there's this tear of this tendon, uh, a lot of compressive load as it runs around there. So it's torn and we've got that uh, retracted uh, uh, atrophic muscle. So chronic rupture. So what we're looking for is a bare facet. As we continue through, we can see our gluteus medius over the top, a bare facet. And as we come on through, uh, lovely atrophic muscle down there, glute medius coming across the top. If you're wondering and, and suspicious, maybe there's a few fibers possibly present, have a look at the muscle, see if it's atrophic. More often than not, if you're thinking there's just maybe a few fibers present, it's probably a full thickness tear. So here's that same patient. So we've got uh, a gluteus medius sitting over the top gluteus minimus atrophy running through we can see a bare facet with just medius sitting over the top talking of medius so uh, quite common to have a tendinopathy of our medius in thesophytes are not uncommon and not associated with pain um, but our tendinopathy next to it is here we are again so a thickened hypoechoic tendon, typical of our tendinopathy. And we can see our more normal looking tendon from the MTJ coming up. And as it gets to that bone and its footprint, it's quite swollen and hypoechoic. Tears in our gluteus medius, they, they often have this pattern to them where that anterior portion of the tendon that has to run over that bare area which can undergo compressive load will quite often uh, start with a undersurface tear. So we can see here a little undersurface tear at our anterior portion. We've got a little bit of tendinopathy of the overlying tendon. As it progresses that uh, may progress undersurface the rest of the way across. We may also get uh, a tear extending through. So this is uh, near probably full thickness, near full thickness tear of our anterior uh, gluteus medius tendon. And then as we continue and that progresses, we will get our full thickness tears through the anterior. Here's our posterior still intact. So absent, we can see as we come up to the muscle, that anterior muscle is atrophic and it looks pretty good back through here. So uh, full thickness anterior gluteus medius tear as as things progress and um, the load continues to come across and that compression onto the rest of the tendon we can get complete ruptures of this anterior band so this is our posterior band coming on down to our posterior superior facet and this is the insertion of our anterior band running across here so this is that bare area that we often uh, can be the cause the start of this problem so 
we can see a, a bare lateral facet and we can see our posterior superior facet which looks a little thickened. So let's just have a look through. Bare facet, we've got our tear and as we come into the muscle, we can see some atrophy in that muscle. Our posterior band from our posterior superior facet, it's usually uh, pretty bulletproof and, and resilient to a lot of things, but when it uh, loses its partner, it can get a little tendinopathic and inflamed. That's uh, you know, quite a significant tendinopathy of uh, that uh, posterior band and quite symptomatic. Uh, that same patient just showing that torn lateral facet. We've just got our glute max sitting over the top of it and here we are back that posterior band onto that posterior superior facet intact but quite tendinopathic. Running back through, you can see tendon would tear quite easily with this compressive load coming across there. And again, looking at our muscle, our posterior band supplying our posterior third intact, anterior band torn and our atrophic muscle there. So uh, I think edu patient education and uh, a guided exercise program are probably the most important things to treat these tendons, but we work in a private practice uh, and we uh, supply a service to referrers. So we will quite often be asked to inject around these tendons. So we inject, have the radiologists inject in plane. So what we find is you will see this tissue plane move as the needle goes in and then it's just a matter of fanning back and forth to pick up the tip of that needle. And here we are, the tip. Uh, the radiologist decided to put a little bit of deep through and superficial to our quite uh, tendopathic and symptomatic gluteus medius. The logics, uh, the GE Logic E has this really nice needle visualization package, so it will highlight any strong reflectors coming in at uh, perpendicular to this band. So we've just angled to where we want to look, and we can see our needle coming in right into that subgluteus maximus. Versa, and that was four mils of injectate that just um, quickly ran away through the bursa. So really nice, easy injection. We can see that needle really nicely uh, with that package. Uh, something we may get uh, in our glutes is about calcific tendinopathies. And, and these calcific tendinopathies are quite common around the shoulder, but we can get them anywhere in the body, and they're due to calcium hydroxyapatate uh, crystal deposition. This runs through several phases, but it's this resorptive phase that it can become quite symptomatic. And, and it's in this phase that we'll see this calcium appear as sort of almost like a white fluffy cloud in the tendon. This white fluffy, fluffy cloud will quite often um, just sort of, I guess, change the contour of the tendon and, and be... And sometimes what we can find is it will rupture out of the tendon into the tissues around and when it ruptures out of the tendons, it, it goes from being just a chronically achy uh, tendon to a extremely, extremely painful uh, area. So it will, it will rupture out into this synovial space, our greater glute, gluteus maximus bursa, and we'll get this quite significant bursitis related to this uh, crystal crystal deposition so when we see this uh, patients quite often in extreme pain they've often ref, um, gone to the emergency department the night before and um, been giving uh, some pain relief and sent away we like to try to um, especially when we see that cloud of calcium there we like to try to reduce that and uh, dissipate it so they don't have ongoing issues uh, so a little bit of local from skin down to bursa, just short of our calcium first, and then a larger bore needle. This is an 18 gauge, which we then uh, punch it into that little collection of calcium. And you can see here, this one spontaneously uh, decompressed for us, which is not a common thing. But what we wanna do is we wanna just increase, without bursting this capsule, we wanna just 
uh, gently pressing our plunger to increase the pressure in this um, sack of calcium and then just release the plunger and let that uh, fluid just wash down and in and back up our, our needle into the syringe. So we just slowly work through and we'll find we'll get a, a, some of those calcium crystals out. Uh, as the syringe gets quite full of um, calcium, we'll quite often change for a, a new a syringe of local anesthetic and just keep flushing. And before we leave, um, withdraw the needle, we'll quite often just introduce a little cortisone into that uh, burst of space just to relieve the symptoms. Uh, gluteus maximus. Uh, a lot of our greater trochanteric pain syndrome patients complain of pain not only the greater trochanter but down that lateral thigh. Um, and so we, we sometimes forget that they can just have issues in that lateral thigh. Uh, our gluteus maximus, it originates from uh, the sort of posterolateral aspect of the femur uh, and it also has an attachment onto our iliotibial band, but it's on that gluteal tuberosity at that posterolateral femur that we can have some tendon issues. So it, it's not a pretty tendon to scan and the size of the tendon can be quite variable. Uh, it can attach a lot more onto the iliotibial band and and less onto the femur, um, be quite variable with that. But here we are here with a patient who pinpointed discomfort right on our gluteus maximus. We can see this little area of tendinopathy here, which they are focally tender over. We can see some normal fibers around. We'll just show you that in long uh, tendinopathy. If we scan through, we can see these nice fibers running through here. This is more a classic look. And it's something, you know, just go have a, a look at a few and get a feel for what they look like because they can be a tricky scan. But, um, yeah, just rem remember to include it if, if somebody's got a little bit of pain down the side of their, their leg a little lower, particularly if they're pointing posterior. And it's also another spot we may encounter a bit of calcium deposition here. So we can see that sitting there in those fibres there. Approximately a typical band syndrome. Uh, this is another pathology which can somewhat mimic our gluteal tendinopathy, um, but instead of uh, complaining of pain right over their greater trochanter, they're more indicating this region up through here. So they'll be indicating there, and it, it tends to be uh, more often than not our females, and particularly our runners, uh, but also those are walking, trying to up the Ks. Um, so... Uh, Tensor fascia latte uh, originates from our PSIS and the first one to two centimetres of our iliac crest. And then as we continue back, about five centimetres back from our ASIS is where our iliotibial band originates from. And this is where we'll see the, the problem. It doesn't relate to our tensor fascia latte. It's our iliotibial band where our gluteus maximus and iliotibial band insert onto our iliac tubercle. So if I'm, I have a patient presenting with um, pain and they're pointing a little above their greater trochanter, I'll always ensure I check this area. If they're even a, just an active runner, I'll, I'll likely have a look. We can see some chronic uh, tendon changes here quite regularly, uh, but what we're looking for is we're looking for this thickening. We're looking for it to be a little bit more hypoechoic, and we're looking quite often for a bit of edema in the muscle below and the tissues above to indicate this is active. And quite often they don't realize they're tender on this area until you push, but, but just just check uh, for tenderness in the area, which is a good sign. And we'll sometimes you can see what looks like a, a little tear deep. If we're lucky, we'll see a bit of hyperemia. Uh, one of the reasons they complain of pain a little distal um, could possibly be due to this little nerve here. And this is our lateral cutaneous branch of the iliohypogastric nerve and it supplies the skin on that lateral uh, hip there. And as you can see here, this is our iliotypical band here looking a bit tendopathic. And this is our nerve having to squeeze around and through these tissue planes. And so it's coming up and trying to get out from deep to superficial and it really thickens up as it comes through. And, 
and irritation of this nerve might be one of those reasons, just my hypothesis. So uh, thank you. I hope you found this helpful. Uh, please feel free to uh, hit myself or Dan up anytime. Uh, we've got a website there. I'll, I'll just run you through a few of the things we do. Uh, in conjunction with G, we, we're running a single day masterclass uh, in October. Um, upper limb, it's a full day in Sydney. Uh, it'll be uh, excellent. There'll be lecture content, didactic live scanning. We also run uh, kind of your more your destination conferences, but uh, the content is always high quality. It's really good. Um, we'll be in Noosa next year at the Peppers Noosa Resort. Half days of lecture and live scanning content and the rest of your day to relax and rejuvenate and just soak in what you've learnt for the morning. We also go to Bali. It is a fantastic event, really fun, uh, really social, drinks the first night. We have dinners early in the week, a um, lot of networking to be done, a lot of friends to be made. Um, really good turnouts in the past. We've, we're, we're back there after COVID, so it's going to be really exciting. Again, it's half days, 8 to maybe 9 to 1, 8.30 to 12.30. I can't quite remember. But we get it at, done within the morning and you get to enjoy your afternoon. You get to go back with a whole load of tricks and real energy to get back into work when you get back home. Uh, we also run our MSK Ultrasound Academy and, and this is uh, sort of we – have 10 live webinars a year, so 10 one-hour webinars. Uh, we skip December and January to avoid the holidays. Uh, these webinars are decided by our members and what they want, and we'll run through uh, a bit of lecture content. We'll do live scanning, a few tips and tricks of what we do. And we quite often cover some of those topics that you won't get in the, the normal uh, conferences you get so you know we might look at uh, uh back you know back ultrasound uh cause of headaches um those unusual things that that don't often get brought up obviously we, we will also run through a lot of hamstring anatomy um but we've got a forum you can ask questions of us you can uh put up cases for discussion and we're always there ready to answer and it's great, we'll, you know, put up uh, some of the latest articles we're reading. Uh, so it's a nice uh, resource for that. It's all, yeah, as I said, all evidence-based. We, we try to back up anything we're saying uh, with uh, latest articles. And we run through a lot of our tips and tricks for how we got a little better and get you uh, just improve your ultrasound in general. So... Thank you again. Um, don't be afraid to reach out. Uh, hopefully we'll see you one day in person. Thanks.